This is the player is reservations in two-way slabs by means of yield lines, and we will deal with case five. Consider a rectangular concrete slab, which is a one, uh, uh, which is a two-way slab, which means that this size is maximum two times the smallest size. We make a reservation into the slab, and this time it's not a centric reservation, but just a reservation rectangular into the slab with a position D3 and D4, and the size of the uh, reservation is D1 times D, D2. The slab is simply supported on all sides, so this was a condition of two-way slabs. This, of course, the hole must be smaller than the slab, and uh, the uh, for instance, D1 plus D3 must be smaller than A, which otherwise this hole will, will be outside the slab. And the same in the other direction, D2 plus D4 from there to there must be smaller than the width. So that are the conditions on the slab. It's a type of hole attracting the yield lines. Again, be careful for it, because when D3 is small, this becomes a little bit unlikely to happen. So this is for uh, general cases. So the hole is big enough to attract the yield lines like this. Now, this angle, we don't know. Normally we know for symmetric things, this is 45 degrees, but, but now because the hole can be everywhere, you have two different angles and we don't know. It. So this is an unknown uh, to us. Uh, unknown in the sense of you can always suppose that those yield lines have different angles and then you can maximize the function. But now it's getting very complicated because of all the variables. So we'll say the corner attracts the yield line and then alpha 1 and alpha 8 and so on. All the alphas are uh, in function of D3 and D4. These were the conditions. Now we'll give you a visual impression what it means. It's a hole like that, a hole like that, uh, a hole somewhere not touching the edges of the slab uh, and not centric. It can be centric, but uh, this is uh, the case of not centric hole attraction, attracting yield lines. You see, all the yield lines are attracted by the corners of the hole. We can now again divide the whole slab into triangles and uh, not square, but uh, rectangulars. And then you will see the uh, um, work done by the external loads for the triangles, the green portion. It's one third of the surface of the slab uh, uh, times the load and you see here that you have to take uh, uh, for instance uh, this one here is d3 times d4 divided by two but we have two of them huh? so it's d3 times d4 one third and then we go over to this portion and this portion and this portion and that's all those terms and at the end that's that's one third and now we will calculate the square or the rectangular uh, elements in orange which the mean deflection is one half the half of the delta and then again now we can for the four elements we can uh, put it here so you can now uh, work it out and you find this simple formula the work done by the internal forces, which are the bending moments, can now be calculated. Is it the yield line projected to the rotation axis? So it will be d4 times the angle, which is delta, divided by uh, uh, d3. So d4 divided by d3 because the delta is here. Huh? Okay. And the other, another direction is this term. So we can do it for the four elements. What, huh? and you arrive at this plus f. So you have, in fact, you should have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, which means this 
uh, uh, projected to this rotation axis, this to this rotation axis, and so you go on in all directions. So you have four corners and two directions, it's eight terms, so that's where, where this is coming from. You can try to simplify it, then you put E is equal to D, and you have the bending moment. This is getting a little bit complicated, not easy to handle. The maximum bearing capacity is defined as 100 times the maximum bending moment without the hole divided to the maximum bending moment with the hole. We have the restrictions of case uh, five types of holes, and we know those restrictions now in dimensionless parameters. And then you can rewrite the, this formula and you obtain this dimensionless formula for the bearing capacity. Now let's give an example. You have a slab like it is situated here, and the slab is situated as 1.5 meters from the top and 1.8 from the side, and it's a, it's a hole of 4.8 times 2.4 meters. The depth of the slab is 18 centimeters, concrete covered 30 millimeters, Floor finish, none, it's a bare floor. Mobile load is four, and the needed reinforcement is uh, asked for. So we calculate the load in ultimate limit state, which is 1.35 times the dead load plus uh, 1.5 times the mobile load, gives you 12.09 kilonewton per square meter. These are the parameters. We calculate now with the formula the maximum bending moment, and it's 26.16 kilonewton meter per meter. We calculate now the lever arm in x direction, which is the total depth minus the cover, minus the point of gravity of the reinforcement. We suppose that it is uh, one layer of reinforcement, and uh, regarding the depth and the bending moment, we estimate that the diameter will be 10. If not, we redo the calculation. So we have 145 millimeters in the x direction, y direction is the second layer of reinforcement, is 135, and the mean lever arm is then 140 millimeters. The needed reinforcement uh, augmented with 10% because it's an upper bound method that you are using is then 525 square millimeter per meter. And this is roughly uh, diameter 10 uh, every 150 millimeters. Now we can plot the graph of bearing capacity in certain situation. And then the y axis is the bearing capacity. The x axis is the size of the uh, it's not the size of the hole, but the distance that the hole moves from the side, like here. So you see, this is a curve for a square hole, 0.2 by 0.2, 0.2 by 0.2. At the distance, uh, D1 of 0.4, this is 0.4, this is 0.4. Huh? Distance from the top is 0.4. And in function of alpha 4, which is the distance from the side. And you will see in this case, it's 160, that's that point. If we move the hole fair the middle, fair the middle, that's point, it's point 0.1 point 0.4, you have 101, which is this point here. So moving this hole from there to there, then you gain, in fact, in, in uh, or you, you lose, sorry, you lose in bearing capacity. This can, not do very much harm, as from this point onwards, you, you will have less bearing capacity in your slab. So this point has definitely, which is there, less bearing capacity, uh, it's here. It's, it's not much, but it is, it's the idea that plays. So moving this hole from there to there plays a big role in the, rest, in the bearing capacity of the slab. Now, we have seen the uh, uh, calculations with the yield lines 
or, or uh, for a slab without a hole. And we have seen uh, formulas for reservations attracting the yield lines. Now, what are we going to use? Eh? What is the difference between the two? Now, let's start with just yield lines uh, without the hole. Eh? This is this for simply supported on all sides, and you have a hole somewhere in the middle. I'm using this example because in the previous videos, I know the formulas for that. So this is type one or case one hole. Huh? And now we've seen also formulas for a, a, a reservation in the slab, uh, which is uh, attracting the yield lines, not centralized, but attracting the yield lines. Now you see, this is the same. So this is the same slab with the same hole in the same position, but we have two different formulas for it. The first, yield lines without the hole, and the second, yield lines by attraction. Now, my opinion is that depending on the position of this hole, sometimes it will follow this case here, and sometimes it will follow this case huh, in reality. So now we know both formulas for both cases, which for this case was this formula, and we can calculate it in this particular case, and it means this is 1.5 times that, and you have a, 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 a hole size of 0.4, yeah, 0.4 of this size. Huh? And then you will see you have here with this formula 103. So it means you can make this reservation and you will not harm the bearing capacity huh, by making this reservation there. Now, if you calculate it by attracting yield lines, this is this, this formula, and we arrive at 109. So there, you do not harm the bearing capacity. But there is a difference between the two methods. Now, it's difficult to choose between the two. And we will see now, if you take an the error and the error is defined as taking the yield lines without the hole divided by the problem with the yield lines attracting the hole. If you do that, then that I call error, and I make a graph of error in function of alpha, which is uh, this side divided by this side. Then you will see for different cases, this is corresponding, corresponding. Uh, for different cases of holes, you will see that sometimes uh, this method is better and sometimes the other method is better. So there is no uh, direct uh, indication what method is the best. But you can see that when this is, this is 100% or 1, uh, that most lines are below. That means that BCA is smaller than BCC, and that means that attracted field lines gives more capacity. So if you want to play safe, you can use this method. But sometimes this is more realistic, huh? but you should know. So that's the disadvantage of yield lines. You don't know where the yield lines are. In to do it right, you have to uh, uh, use a parameter indicating the angle of the yield line, and then you have to maximize the function to see which yield line will give you the uh, most severe condition. And you see that in this graph, it goes from 0.6 to 1.2. When you look now at um, when alpha is 1.5 and you look at the red curve for alpha 1.5, that means this line here, you need 1.17, which is that point. Then you arrive at the green, which is 0.74. Then you have this color, and then at least you have this color. So for all types of holes, you will see that sometimes this is better, sometimes this is better. 